by some traditional Christmas music today.
pray that we would show you our adoration this morning. It's incomprehensible that you came from heaven in perfect perfection and sinlessness and were born into a world full of sin and actually took it on for us and became sin for us to cleanse us. God, we can't express that. We can't express how much we need to thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you'll find these praises acceptable this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. seated. We're going to have three young ladies come this morning and sing a Christmas song with us. It's the Plaid Girls, I think is the name of the band. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels try when you kiss your little baby you kiss the face of god mary did you know Bye. 
blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again, the lame will leave, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? That sleeping child you're holding is the great You can head out to your classes, and uh, as they're going out, why don't we uh, bow together and let's pray again this morning. <clears throat> Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for just the incompre incomprehensible gift of your only beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus, we thank you that... Uh, even though you're God, that you left the, the worship and the splendor and the glory of heaven to, came, to come to be born uh, as a man, to live as a man, to ultimately die for us as an outcast, as a criminal. Lord, we thank you for the good news of that, that through what you have done for us, that there is peace and there's hope, there's forgiveness. God, I pray that you give us the, the faith uh, to believe that today. Lord, uh, pray that as we talk about comfort, we thank you that uh, there's comfort in your word, that your Holy Spirit is our comforter, and Lord, for those who are hurting and grieving today, God, we uh, just ask that your spirit would be their, your, their comforter, that he would work in, in each of our lives, and uh, that we would just receive, Lord, what you have for us to help us with the trials and the difficulties that uh, we inevitably uh, go through in our lives, and Lord, we just ask you to minister and to work in this time, and uh, make us receptive to your word, and, and bring about your will in each of our lives. We thank you for what you're going to do, we thank you for all the ways you bless us, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. You know, the holidays are supposed to be uh, a happy time, but for a lot of people, they're really the saddest time of the year. Uh, the studies show that depression, suicide rates, uh, those type of things go up during uh, the, the holidays. And, and I think some of that is because if it's a time you're supposed to be happy and you're really not, it seems to just kind of uh, increase the intensity of feelings about things. But one of the things that, that we know just about being a human being in this world is that one of the ways that we're all the same is that everybody has trials, tribulations, and difficulties in, in life. There's an old REM song by the title, Everybody Hurts. And uh, that's true. I mean, life works uh, that way. And, you know, some of you today, you know, you may be feeling good. You may be excited about the holidays. I know some of you, that's not how you're feeling. And, uh, you know, the reality is in life, we're either in a storm We've just come out of one, or at some point we're headed into one. I mean, that's just how life works. So maybe you're on the mountain, maybe you're in the valley, but you're somewhere in there, you're going to be headed into something. I mean, you know, some of you have lost loved ones this year. Uh, some of you, uh, you're facing some kind of sickness. Some of you, there's family difficulties, and the holidays only uh, 
heighten the difficulties there. Uh, some of you are having financial pressures and difficulties, and the holidays can definitely uh, make that worse, make that more challenging, uh, make that more, more difficult. And the reality is, as we face these trials and difficulties, we, we all want to be comforted, right? I mean, we, we all want to experience comfort in the midst of our suffering. And what we're going to, to look at today is how that we can experience that. Because honestly, the, the problem a lot of times in our life uh, really is that we look for comfort in the wrong places. Right? A, a lot of the dumb things that we've done that caused us greater problems in our lives have been when we were looking for comfort in the wrong places. Uh, for some people, that's where addictions come from. You know, trying to fill a hole, uh, soothe the pain. Uh, sometimes, you know, the bad relationship decisions that people make is they're, they're looking for comfort, looking for something to make them feel better. So uh, the, the question is, how can we really, truly be comforted in, in, in the midst of our pain, in, in, in the midst of our suffering? And so we're going to look at a, at a text in 2 Corinthians 1 uh, from the Apostle Paul. And uh, this was a man who knew a lot about suffering from his own experience. In fact, I, I would say that none of us could claim to experience the amount of suffering that he experienced in his life. I mean, he was almost killed several times as a Christian, ultimately was martyred as a Christian, but he was beaten, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was abused, he was spent time in, in prison, uh, he was falsely accused. Uh, just, you know, he lists in different places in the New Testament these long lists of all the suffering, all the trials, all the difficulties that he went through. And so I think that he is someone, because of what he's been through, who could certainly uh, speak into our lives. In fact, if you look here in, in let's, let's, we're going to read verses 8 through 11 right now. We're primarily going to focus on uh, verses 3 through 7, but look, look at verse 8. He says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which, we came, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. You ever felt that way? You ever felt like you were burdened beyond measure, uh, beyond the strength that you had? And he said, despaired even of life. You ever just felt like giving up? Just, just felt like, I don't even know how I can go on anymore. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, that for a man like Paul to say something like that actually encourages me. Because I must not just be completely nuts for uh, thinking that way uh, occasionally if he felt that way uh, at a point in, in, in his life. And, and so he says, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. And, and, and so really, part of the time, the, part of the reason that we go through suffering is, is God is using that so that we'll trust Him and not trust in ourselves. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes when we go through suffering, it's God's purpose in it is to get us to trust Him. Uh, he, he's, he's using these trials to rid us of our self-sufficiency, our self-reliance, our, our faith in ourselves, and, and, and get us to trust in, in Him. Um, he says, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust, that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given to many persons, by many persons on our behalf, for the gift granted to us through many. Now, that kind of says where he was at uh, during this time. So let's circle back around and, and look at what he says in verses 3 through 7. He says, blessed... Which, and the word bless means to say a good word about. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. 
Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. And so here's the main idea of, of this passage. This is what I want us to see today. There's really two parts to it, and so we'll break it down and look at each side of it. But, but this is really the main idea of what he's saying to us in, in this text. What he's saying is we have a Father who comforts us in our trials so that then we can be a comfort to others. We have a Heavenly Father who comforts us in our trials, so then we can turn around and be a comfort to others. We can take the comfort that He's given us and share it with other people. I mean, that, that's what He says. Uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So when we're going through trials and tribulations, if we're a Christian, we have a Heavenly Father who wants to minister comfort to us, but then He doesn't want us just to be a reservoir of that comfort. He wants us to be a channel through which the comfort, the ministry that He's given to us, then flows to other people. So, if you've gone through some trials and you've experienced God's comfort, you're qualified to be a minister. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in more detail at the end, but that's, that's part of what he's saying here. Now, when we think about the word comfort, well, what's it mean? It's important for us to understand that. And, and basically what it means, it means encouragement. It means consolation. Uh, maybe the best word picture of it is, it literally it means to come alongside someone. And that's a great truth to know that God it comes alongside us in our trials, in our sufferings. He, he's with us. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't leave us. If you're going through a hard time, God's not forgotten about you. or It's not that He's put you in that just to leave you there. He's coming into your mess with you. That's the kind of God He is. He's the Father of mercies. He's the God of all comfort. Now, maybe the, the question is, is well, I mean, if, if He, instead of coming alongside of us, why didn't He just keep us from suffering, right? I mean, that, that's really what we would prefer. I mean, I mean, let's be honest about it. That's what we prefer. Why, you know, why is there suffering in the world? We, we ask those kind of questions. Uh, why, why do bad things happen to good people? Why, why does God let people go through things like this? I mean, why would He just not keep us from this instead of walking through it with us? Well, here's the answer. He's true to Himself. And, and when God made the world... He, he set up the world, and, and He created human beings in His image, and He gave us the ability to choose, and along with that, experience the consequences of our choices. And, and so that means when we chose to sin, and when we choose to sin, there are going to be consequences to those actions. We live in a fallen world. A fallen world cannot be without suffering. I mean, God would have to completely reverse who He is and the way He set up everything to work. And, and so, the thing about it is this. Since we have made these choices that created the, the, the situation and circumstance for there to be suffering in the world, God could just sit back and say, well, there you go, you're getting what you deserve. Too bad, so sad. You know, just deal with it the best that you can. But He is such a loving and merciful and caring God that instead of doing that, He entered into our mess with us. I mean, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, 
who have forever and ever been in the perfection and glory and splendor of heaven, came to be born as a little baby in a manger, stable, cave, whatever it, exactly uh, that, that, that it was, you know, in, in a mess. He lived in a messy, sinful world. He was mistreated. He came and became one of us, and he ultimately became sin for us. So that, in part, he could walk alongside of us. Now, the Bible says he'll never leave us or forsake us. God's not abandoned us in our trials, in our difficulties, in our suffering. And he proved that. He proved his love for us when he came into this world and went all the way to the cross for our sins. That's the kind of God that He is. And, you know, it's, it's part of the gospel that we deserve judgment, but that God offers us salvation and blessing and comfort and encouragement and ministry. And, and, and so, you know, the first side of this is that our Heavenly Father comforts us in our trials. I mean, look again at verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort. So, God is our Heavenly Father. I mean, that's how He relates to us, if we're Christians. Um, but, you know, for some people, when they think about Father, that evokes painful images. It, it, it evokes images of abandonment or hurt. But the Bible says their Heavenly Father is the Father of mercies. I, I love the verse in the Psalms where the psalmist said he came into God's presence in, the, in, in his manifold mercies. And isn't it good to know that God has manifold mercies because we have manifold sins? But his grace is greater than all of our sin. Where sin is abounded, grace has abounded more. He's the Father of mercies, he's the God of all comfort. But notice when he says, bless me the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So really, you can only truly experience this if Jesus is your Lord. Because if Jesus isn't your Lord, God is not your Father. You're not connected to Him. You're separated from Him. And all you'll ever ultimately, well, you'll experience grace. You're experiencing grace, common grace. Just the fact that God is letting you live and He's providing for you and taking care of you. But ultimately, what you'll experience from God is judgment, not comfort, unless you come to God through Jesus Christ, submitting your life to the Lordship of Christ, trusting in Him, because that's how we have a relationship with God, where God becomes our Father. But when, once God becomes our Father, the Bible says there's no more condemnation. So what God has for us is comfort and blessing and encouragement and help. He's with us. He's in us through His Holy Spirit. And so, <coughs> if you think about the person who comforts us, it's our Heavenly Father, and, and, and that's the kind of God that He is. That's, that's His nature. Now, when, um, when I think about this, I think about being a parent. I, I think it became easier to relate to God as my father once I had children. And so, you know, I think about my kids. When, uh, when, when they were little, um, <clears throat> particularly the girls, but all my kids were scared of dogs. But, I mean, Lily was kind of almost irrationally afraid uh, of dogs. I mean, there'd be a dog that'd be this big, you know, and she'd go into hysterics. And, uh, you know, she'd come running to you. And you know how your kids are little? They come running to you, and they have their, you know, arms up like this. And sometimes they fall on their face because they're already uncoordinated, and this is not the optimal position to run in. But, uh, you know, when you're a, a small child and you want to reach out to your father, you have your arms like this, and um, you expect to get picked up, right? And... Um, you know, when she would do that over really what was an irrational fear, you know, just, I don't know, three years old or whatever, I didn't look at her and say, well, that's irrational. You just go deal with it. Uh, I would pick her up and give her a hug. 
right? And, and I'm sure that, you know, God looks down at us and just kind of shakes his head at us and like, you know, that's so silly. Why are they freaking out about that? But, you know, he, when we reach out to him, he picks us up and he holds us. He's there uh, for us. Um, you know, Molly's 17 now, and recently she was upset about something, which she didn't really get that way very often, but her mom had talked to her, and then, uh, you know, she came to me, and uh, I'm the typical male. My default mode is to dispense advice and uh, tell you what you ought to do and how you can fix this and how everything uh, will be better, and uh, which is, is true part of the time anyway, but uh, uh, this time I was actually good. Ladies, you should be proud of me. I just listened. Uh, I, I didn't talk. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, I'll try to remember that in the future. But uh, I, I just listened. She just kind of came, sat on, on uh, my lap, and uh, I just kind of listened to her. And then at some point, she just kind of like curled up in a little ball like she was a little baby and just kind of let me hold her. And after a little while after that, she was fine. And uh, hopefully I learned something from that. But uh, that's, that's kind of just what we all need sometimes, right? And, and that's who our father wants to be in our lives. He's with us, whatever we're going through. He's there for us. You know, the Bible says that Jesus, because he came as a man, because of the Christmas story, because he's been tempted in every way like as we are, yet without sin, that he sympathizes with us in our suffering. The Holy Spirit is the comforter who lives inside of us, who's always there to minister to us. And so, that's the person who comforts us. But, but look at the second thing here is that the, the promise of his comfort. It says he comforts us in all our tribulation. That's a great promise. I encourage you the next time that you're going through something to claim that. To, to, to go to your father for comfort instead of looking for it in something else. Claim this promise. But there is something else we need to see here. That's the parameters of his comfort. There, there are some limits to this. I mean, when you first read this, it sounds like an unconditional promise that in whatever situation, I can just claim his comfort. But, but there, there really is a, a limit to this if you read it in his context. If you read verses 5 through 7, he says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. So here's the thing. It's important when we're going through a trial to try to discern why we're going through the trial. In some trials, there's just some things that are going to happen just because we live in a fallen world. Um, two of my kids are sick right now. That's just part of living in a fallen world where our bodies are in decay because of sickness. It just happens sometimes. You know, sometimes we suffer because of what other people are doing. Sometimes God puts us through trials, not because we're in the wrong, but because we're in the right, but he's using that trial to further build our faith, to further mature us, to further shape us, to further refine us. But the Bible also teaches us for Christians that while we'll never be judged in a condemning sense, that God disciplines us. Hebrews 12. So sometimes the trials that we go through as Christians are God's response to our sin and Him dealing with our sin, Him uh, bringing us to a place of repentance, Him changing us, and, and He allows us to go through those difficulties. So here's the thing. When Paul says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ, he's saying when we suffer for Jesus' sake, God's consolation, God's comfort is working in us. But the further implication is when we're suffering because of our own sin, God still wants to comfort us, but he won't comfort us until we repent. See, sometimes we're going through something, and, and we're like, why isn't God coming through why isn't God answering my prayer? Why isn't God fixing this? When the reality is that God is more interested in fixing you at the moment than he is fixing the situation. 
God wants to work through this situation to change and, 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 and de- change us and to deal with our sin. Listen, if you're in a trial that's disciplined, if you're in a trial because of sin, you can't pray your way out of it. You can only repent your way out of it. God's not going to let it go until you do what he's telling you to do. And, and, and so it, it's kind of like, um, you know, when my kids were little and, and I would spank them. And, and we did do that. And if I had more kids, I'd do it all over again. Um, but, you know, we have a boy, two girls. Uh, Jay wasn't that difficult to spank because he just made me mad. And so what I have to watch out for there is not spanking in anger. You know, he's boys, strong-willed, that kind of thing. And so that, that's not that, that wasn't that hard. But what was hard was the girls because, uh, you know, they like start crying when you just look at them. And, uh, you know, sometimes that would make me mad. And, and sometimes, you know, I feel kind of sorry for them. You know, girls can tug at a, at a dad's heart. But, uh, you know, that's not the point of it. The point of it is for the behavior to be corrected. So uh, if, if you just, like if your kid cries and you don't spank them or whatever kind of discipline when they deserve it, you're just teaching them that they can cry their way out of something. And that's setting them up for problems uh, later on in their life. So can't give in to that. And so, uh, you know, spank them. But then after you discipline your kids, you should hug them, love on them, uh, comfort them, encourage them once the situation has been dealt with. And that's kind of what I'm saying that God does uh, with us. He spanks us, so to speak, to correct us. Then he comforts us and encourages us. We, we want to get that backwards, though, like uh, our kids want to get that backwards. And so we got to understand that that's how God works. And so if God's comforting us, here, here's, the, here's the question. How does he comfort us? I mean, how does this process work? And, and really, I, I see three ways scripturally that God comforts us. They all start with P, so maybe you can remember them. One, God comforts us personally. Um, in, in the Gospel of John, John 14, for example, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit, depending on your translation, being our comforter. Um, God comforts us just simply by his presence in our lives. There's a verse in, in Philippians that I don't know that I can explain it to you, but if you've ever experienced it, I don't have to explain it to you, that says there's a peace that passes all understanding. And if you've been through a trial and, and you've experienced a supernatural peace. God has just given you the strength, the calm to deal with something. That is his personal comfort. That's part of what it means to have himself through his spirit living on the inside of us. God comforts us personally. We see in this text in verse 11 that God comforts us through prayer. He says, you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons Uh, by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So what Paul is saying is that his deliverance in this situation that he talked about came as a result of many people praying. Now that's a great promise. That's a great encouragement to us, I think. I don't understand it. I I mean, prayer is intellectually is very difficult to understand. But Have you ever said something like, man, I can just feel people praying for me? You ever heard somebody say that? I mean, sometimes you can just experience a strength. There's just a sense that people are praying for you. And, of course, God can do anything that he wants to do. He's sovereign, but in his sovereignty, according to his word, he has chosen to work through the prayers of his people. And this verse is a particular example of that. So as we pray, as people pray for us, for us, God works through those prayers to bring comfort, to bring help, to bring encouragement. You know, as we pray, God's always working in us, and He's also working in our circumstances. He doesn't always change our circumstances like we want Him to, but when we pray, He's always changing us. And so one of the things that we can do, if we want to be a comfort, encouragement, and minister to other people, is just to pray for people. I mean, think about the Apostle Paul. 
Maybe the greatest man of God who ever lived talked about how the gift of this deliverance in this situation was granted to him through the prayers of other people. Listen, sometimes we get in a place where we're just almost too weak to pray. We need people interceding, stepping in on, on our behalf. Uh, that, that's a ministry that God calls us to have for other people. And then uh, we see here that the process is comfort. It's personal, it's prayer, but it's also through people. That's part of what it means to be the body of Christ, right? That we're the hands and feet of Jesus. Look what Paul said in chapter 7. Uh, verses 6 and 7, he, he says, look at this, Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. Do you see what he's saying there? God comforted him, but tangibly the way that he comforted him was through Titus coming to him to minister to him. But it wasn't just Titus coming. Titus had been in contact with the church there at Corinth, and he was comforted by them. And, and, and then Paul was comforted, he says here, when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me. And when Paul heard that, he says, I rejoiced even more. He was comforted by the ministry directly of Titus, but then indirectly of this entire church in this city. You know, here's the reality. It's bad to suffer, to suffer alone. Amen? It's bad to suffer, but it's horrible to suffer alone. And part of what it means to be the body of Christ is that nobody in the body should suffer alone. That we're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus and come alongside of people so that in a sense, He's coming alongside of people to comfort them through us. I mean, I, I think about uh, different uh, situations that we've gone through in, in, in our lives. You know, Robin's mom had an aneurysm and died 11 days later um, when, when uh, the first year of our marriage. And... Um, she was a charter, longtime member of Manly Baptist Church. And, you know, I think about the people from their church that were there to minister uh, to their family, uh, their deacon, a man by the name of Gene Tidwell, who I think he's related to you, isn't he, Angela? I mean, he was like one of the first people at the hospital, spent the night with the family uh, the, the first night, many other people uh, from there. You know, I think about when my brother uh, died, our church family in Maryland, you know, people coming to our house. Uh, I mean, a lot of it's a blur from that night, but I remember a lot of people being there. I remember people from different states driving here to uh, be with us uh, when, uh, you know, when we came down here for the funeral. In, in fact, one of the biggest factors in my dad becoming a Christian after that was a friend of mine, his priest here, Paul Reginaldi, who came from Maryland down here for the funeral and then talked to my dad and ministered to my dad after the funeral. You know, I, I think about when we've been in the hospital with Molly a couple times, you know, when she had heart surgery, when she was three days old, and the people there who were in Washington, D.C., at the hospital with us, you know, the man who drove us down to the hospital when they flew us down there, and then him and his wife came back to stay with us in the middle of the night, the night that she almost died, and people who were there uh, for the surgery, and then people in, in, you know, states all over the country praying for us, and then many of you who came to the hospital when she had uh, a seizure a few years ago, that's what this is talking about us being there for each other. The, the body of Christ truly being the hands and feet of Jesus that God tangibly works through to meet people's needs. And so the first side of this is we have a Heavenly Father who comforts us in our trials, but then that leads into the second side of this so that we can then be a comfort to others. I mean, look at what he says again in verse 4. It says in verse 3, Father, mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, 
that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. What I said before, we're not reservoirs of His ministry, we're channels of His ministry. Maybe it looks something like this. Bob, Bob Green uh, wrote a column in uh, the Chicago Tribune a few years ago entitled, From One Sufferer to Another. And he talked about a young man by the name of Douglas Maurer uh, who was in Missouri who at 15 years old uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. And uh, as the doctors gave him the diagnosis and described what he was going to have to go through, what was going to happen in his body, those kind of things, he, he went into a deep depression. And uh, one of his aunts called a floral shop uh, and asked them to send him an arrangement of, uh, of flowers. And she told the lady who took the order at the shop that it was for her teenage uh, nephew who had just been diagnosed with leukemia. And Mr. Green says in his column, he says this, when the flowers arrived at the hospital, they were beautiful. Douglas read the card from his aunt. Then he saw a second card. It said, quote, Douglas, I took your order. I work at Bree Florist. I had leukemia when I was seven years old. I'm 22 years old now. Good luck. My heart goes out to you. Sincerely, Laura Bradley. His face lit, lit up. He said, oh, it's funny. Douglas Maurer was in a hospital filled with millions of dollars of the most sophisticated medical equipment. He was being treated by expert doctors and nurses with medical training totaling in the hundreds of years. But it was a sales clerk in a flower shop, a woman making $170 a week, who by taking the time to care and by being willing to go with her, what her heart told her to do, gave Douglas hope and the will to carry on. See, when she shared that she had been through this and she had made it through, it gave him the hope to believe that that could happen for him. That's what this is talking about. As God comforts us, as God ministers to us, as God blesses us, then we can share it to other people. You see, sometimes, maybe all the time, when we're going through a trial, we want to know why. Why is this happening? What's the purpose in this? And you know, I can't necessarily tell you why your trial is happening. I don't think sometimes we're ever really going to know why our trial is happening. But we can know biblically from this is one of the purposes of our trials, whatever they may be, and for whatever reason we're experiencing it, part of, the, part of what God wants to do through it is he wants to turn our misery into a ministry. He, he wants to take this and then use it in other people's lives in the future. Because let's be honest. When we're going through something, what do we want? We want somebody who can relate to us, who can empathize with us. And the person, the people that can do that more effectively are people who have been through, have made it through something similar to what you're going through. You see, a lot of times... I think one of the things that's hurt the church is we've turned ministry into this professional kind of thing. And that's the exact opposite of what this is saying. If you've been through some stuff, you're qualified to minister. You're more qualified than somebody who's a, quote, professional. Listen, I've learned a whole lot more about ministry in the crucible of trials and sufferings than I ever did in seminary. I mean, I think when you're going through something difficult, you're not really all that interested in somebody's degrees and, and, and credentials. You're interested in whether or not they can care about you and empathize with you and understand you. And if they've been through what you've been through, then they can do that. So you know, when we're trying to figure out what God wants to do through our lives, what his purpose is for us, how he wants us to serve him. Uh, you know, Rick Warren uses this acrostic called shape to talk about how we're shaped to serve God. S, spiritual gifts. H, heart. You know, what are we passionate about? A is abilities, natural talents. Uh, P is uh, passion. You know, what are, what are we passionate about? But then E is experiences, and in particular, the difficult experiences that we've gone through then show us how we should minister. It's kind of like this. 
One of the most famous pastors of the 20th century was a man by the name of George W. Truett. He pastored First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas for almost uh, 50 years, and it was followed by W.A. Criswell. The two of them literally pastored that church for over 100 years uh, combined. But he, he tells a story in one of his messages about a, a family in their community who weren't Christians who had a, a baby die. And he ministered to them. He did the funeral. And sometime after that, they, they got saved. They, they trusted Christ. Well, there was a, 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 a young lady, a single mom in their church who uh, lost her baby, and she was just basically inconsolable. And he tried to minister to them, couldn't seem to be able to help them. Finally, he asked this other mother to go and minister to her. And basically what she said is, you know, I, I kind of understand because I've been where you've been. I wasn't a Christian, but uh, God drew me to himself uh, through this experience. He comforted me. He enabled me to get through this, and he'll do the same thing for you. That's what this verse is talking about. Who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And so... This is what we would encourage you to do. Based on what this is, this is saying, what I would encourage you to do is just right now, I'd encourage you to think about some people that you know who have had a tough year. People who are going through a hard time. And, and I would encourage you to find, take your notes or find a piece of paper and just as God brings people to your mind to jot down some names. Think about who can you pray for? Who can you maybe make a phone call to? Send an email, send a card, go see. But who do you know personally that needs some comfort right now that you can minister to in some way? I mean, it, it seems like when we read this passage, isn't that part of at least what we should do with it? I encourage you to do this. If, if you want to take your connection card on the back of it, um, if you know some people that need something like that, jot their names down. Give us some contact info. We'll reach out to them from the church. I mean, just write on your connection card, put it in the offering box. Or if you would be willing to send some notes of encouragement on behalf of the church to people like that, if you'll write that on your connection card and, and, and turn it in, we'll give you some names of some people that you can contact. Something that, that we're going to do, um, we planned on starting this in, in January when we start back with our uh, Wednesday night classes next semester. We're going to do a grief support group. We decided to go ahead and start it during the holidays. And that's actually going to start here in the conference room on Wednesday night. So if you're if it's grieving in any way right now, we'd invite you to come to that. If you know people, they don't have to go to True Life that you think would, that would be a good fit for. Uh, we encourage you to invite them and, and, and encourage them to come and, and be a part of that. God wants us, once again, to be channels, to be conduits, to be people that His comfort, His encouragement, His consolation flows through to other people. He wants us to function as his hands and feet, to tangibly let him come alongside of people by coming alongside of them through us. That's the second side of this. But the first side of it is that we have a Heavenly Father who comforts us in our trials. So, Do you need comfort today? I mean, is something hurting you, something you're struggling with. I mean, I, I seriously doubt if any of us don't have something like that. I mean, if you don't right now, you should probably be getting Pentecostal in here praising God, seriously. I mean, you're a very blessed person if you have no hurts or pains in your life right now. So what is it? What do you need to take to your Father in Heaven to let Him comfort you? Well, maybe here's a relevant question. Is He your Father in Heaven? Is Jesus Christ your Lord? 
You see, when, when, he, say, when he says here in verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the significance of the phrase our Lord Jesus Christ means if we're in Christ, if he's our Lord Jesus Christ, that everything that belongs to him now belongs to us. All the riches of Christ are at our disposal through faith and prayer and obedience. But if that's not the case, once again, we're separated from God. But if we're in Christ, we're joint heirs with Christ. We have a new nature. We've become partakers of the divine nature, the Bible says. It says that he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That means that in Christ, through God the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, we have everything we need to face any situation that we're going to face if we'll trust him with it. But, once again, apart from being in Christ, we're out here on our own, separated from God. God loves you. Jesus came to die for you. He wants to, you to be reconciled to him. He wants to bless you, to comfort you, to help you, to encourage you, to ultimately bring you into his eternal presence forever and ever. But it can only happen when you confess, when you repent of your sins, when you place your faith and trust in Christ and trust Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation. Have you done that? This is what we're going to do. I, I, I'm going to lead us in prayer. I'm going to pray, lead us in prayer in just a moment. But after that, we're, we're going to have a time of, of invitation. They're going to come and sing. And basically, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to be at the front if you need to talk to somebody or there's somebody else that we can match you up with that, that, to talk to them if you need to go somewhere and talk. But we, we do this occasionally. But basically, what we're going to do today is we're going to divide the altar in half. We're just going to open up the altar for prayer. And, and if you just want to be alone just with you and God, if, if you'll go to this side, my left, your right, that'll signify you just want to be alone. You just want to have some time to be able to pour your heart out to God. Okay? But if you want to go to, if you go to this half, this side, my right, your left, that'll signify that you want somebody to come and pray for you. And, and when you see people, men, if you see a man over here, somebody come and pray for him. Ladies, you see a lady over here, somebody come and, and pray for her. So after we pray, that's what we're going to do. Just open it up, uh, give you a chance just to, to meet with your Father in heaven. Let him minister to you. Let him comfort you. And I encourage all of us to just take the other side of this and, and do some of the things we ask or something else, but share that comfort, minister to others, encourage others. So let's bow our heads and, and close our eyes. Just what's going on in your life? What do you need from the Lord today? Particularly, if you need salvation. The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I encourage you right now to call on His name. To ask Him to forgive you. To ask Him to come into your life. To tell Him that you believe in Him. Listen, if you've got questions about that, you need some further explanation about becoming a Christian, come see me and we'll match you up with somebody who can walk you through the scriptures and, and make that clear, make sure you understand how that works. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Lord, we know that we don't deserve that, but we praise you that you're a loving and a and a comforting God, that that's your heart, even though we deserve judgment. Lord, we thank you that you sent your Son to atone for our sins so that you could be that way in our lives and at the same time still be just and righteous and, and deal with sin. We thank you for the gospel. Lord, I, I pray that if there are people here today who don't know you, that your Spirit would draw them to you. Lord, I pray for all of us that... Uh, you minister your comfort and uh, your strength to us. God, help us to humble ourselves, to trust you, to find our sufficiency in you and, and not in ourselves. Lord, just pray that the Holy Spirit 
would have full sway in all of our hearts, that we wouldn't quench him in any way, but that we would respond to you, and that we'd take this and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing, and um, like I said, the altar's open. If you want to be by yourself with the Lord, you come to, to your right. If you want somebody to pray with you, you come to your left. thing before we go, um, sing one other song, and uh, a lot of you know the song 10,000 Reasons by Matt Redman, and you know, the, that verse, it starts by saying, you know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's other verses in the New Testament that say uh, a similar thing, and it's, it's basically a doxology of praise. Uh, the word blessed is the Greek word that we get our English word eulogy from. It means to say a good word about. You know, God owns everything. We can't really give him anything, but uh, we can give him praise for all the good things that he does for us. We can bless the Lord, O oh my soul, in the words of that song. So we're going to close by singing that song to do what that verse says, to bless the Lord, uh, to thank him, praise him for the blessings that, that he gives us.
Y'all have a great week. Come back next week and bring a friend.